If your doctor told you antidepressants were completely safe in pregnancy, they lied to you. Because the truth is, these drugs can cause a wide range of neurological and developmental problems that have been completely swept under the rug and ignored by most doctors. And so today in this video, we're gonna be walking through what every future mother deserves to know about antidepressants so they can make an informed decision that not only affects them, but also their baby. And for those of you who don't know me, my name is Dr. Yosef Witdering. I'm a board certified psychiatrist and I'm an expert in psychiatric drug side effects. I hope this helps. When I was in training, we would often put young women on psychiatric medications and never even mention the risks that would affect pregnancy. We'd simply say, hey, you know, this drug might cause a bit of nausea. You might have a little bit of agitation after you start. And that was it really. And on the rare occasion that a woman even asked about fertility or pregnancy, I'd often hear my attending say something like this, you know, the current data shows these drugs are safe in pregnancy, essentially waving away any concern the mom might have. Typically, the woman would feel reassured and she'd take the medication, believing that she wasn't harming her fertility or the baby. I now know that was a lie, and it's actually one of the worst lies you can tell someone. And so it's time to come clean about what the data really show about the effects of antidepressants during pregnancy. And the truth is, is that all women deserve to know the truth about what these medications do in pregnancy, not just those who are planning to become pregnant. Because after all, nearly 50% of pregnancies are not planned. So let's dive into this topic. But before I do that, I just wanna make a quick note about something. If you've already had a baby while taking an antidepressant, I don't want this to scare you. Many of my friends have, and they have beautiful, healthy children who are doing well. The truth is, the risks are real, but it's also hard to know how much it affects different kids. Some kids seem to be unaffected, while others may be more vulnerable. And so if this is your story, please don't blame yourself, because you were simply doing the best you could with the information that you had at the time. And so with that aside, let's talk a little bit about what we're going to cover in today's video. Firstly, we're going to talk about the visible brain changes in newborns and adolescents exposed to antidepressants in utero. We're going to look at the long-term behavioral effects that exposure causes in children. And we're also going to look at why doctors are still sweeping this issue under the rug. So let's by talking about how antidepressants interfere with early brain development. Now, from the third week after conception, the baby's brain begins to fully form. And over the next eight months, it grows from a speck to a fully formed human brain. During this time, the brain is building billions of neurons, forming and pruning synaptic connections, and laying the foundation for emotion, memory, and self-regulation. And guess what plays a critical role in all of this? Serotonin. It's not just a feel-good chemical, but a developmental signal that's gonna tell neurons where to grow, when to connect, and how to shape the networks that govern emotion and cognition. And so when we artificially alter serotonin levels in the womb using SSRIs, we're not just treating maternal depression. We may be disrupting early brain development at the most sensitive time imaginable. And this is a risk with all psychiatric medications. Every single one of them can cross the placenta and enter the fetal bloodstream. And this is the core issue because the claim that antidepressants and SSRIs are safe in pregnancy completely ignores what we know about serotonin's role in guiding brain development. So let's go and have a look at some studies and see what they show. And the first one is a neurodevelopmental brain changes study by Jar et al, and that was done in 2016, and it looked at white matter. This study used high resolution MRIs to scan the brains of newborns, and they looked at three main cohorts. The first cohort had 27 neonates who were exposed to SSRIs in all three trimesters of pregnancy. The next group had 54 kids whose mom had neither depression nor were exposed to SSRIs. And the final group was 41 neonates who were born to mothers who had depression but were not exposed to SSRIs. And these MRIs looked at the gross structure of the brains as well as the microstructure of the white matter. And what it found was shocking. It found widespread abnormalities in white matter microstructure. This is essentially the brain's wiring system. And these abnormalities were not found in the babies born to depressed mothers who were unmedicated. And so what this means is that the issue wasn't the depression of the mother itself causing these white matter abnormalities. It was actually drug exposure. And now why does this matter? Well, it matters because white matter allows for different parts of the brain to communicate with each other. And these things are important for attention, impulse control, learning and executive functioning. And disruptions in white matter early in life can lead to behavioral and cognitive changes later. 
that sometimes don't even show up until school age. Now, the next study that I want to talk about is the Generation R study that looked at longitudinal brain development over time. Now, in this study, they followed over 3,000 mother-child pairs from pregnancy through age 15. And the scientists compared three groups, those exposed to SSRIs in utero, those who had untreated depression, so unmedicated depression, and the kids also who were born to mothers who didn't have depression. And they then did MRIs at a few different ages. They did them at age 10 and then between ages 13 to 15. These MRIs measured the volume of gray and white matter structures in the brain, such as the subcortical structures like the amygdala and the hippocampus. And what they found was that children exposed to SSRIs in utero had reduced gray matter in the areas related to emotional regulation, memory, and stress response. And they had an enlarged amygdala, which is the part of the brain that processes emotional responses. And these differences were not found in the children of depressed but unmedicated mothers. And they found that these changes had persisted all the way into adolescence, essentially meaning the gray matter changes had still not normalized to what was being seen in the unmedicated children by age 15. And so the bottom line here is that SSRI exposure may not just cause short-term changes, but it can actually alter the developmental trajectory of the brain all the way into adolescence and potentially beyond. And just in case you're thinking these are isolated findings, they're not. I've shown you two of the most compelling studies, but I actually have eight others from labs around the world that show structural and functional changes in developing brains exposed to SSRIs and the womb. When multiple research teams keep on finding the same thing, we need to stop pretending that this is just some coincidence. And so the evidence here is really consistent. It shows that SSRIs, when they're given to kids during pregnancy, are associated with measurable changes in the brain's structure and function, not just when they're little kids, but also continuing into adolescence and possibly beyond. And so with that in mind, let's talk about the next important study here. And this is a study by Zani and colleagues published in 2025. And this looked at behavioral and emotional changes seen in both animals and humans exposed to antidepressants during pregnancy. And so this study had two arms. They had one arm that looked at mice and another that looked at humans. And there were a hundred mice in the mice arm and they were given fluoxetine or as it's commonly known, Prozac or saline during a critical period of brain development that corresponds to roughly the third trimester in humans. These mice were then subjected to behavioral testing in response to a predator odor. This predator odor was meant to be something that would stress them out and they could look at their brains and see how their brain was interpreting this stressor. And to measure that, they used functional MRI and also immunochemistry studies. And what they found compared to those controls who weren't exposed, they found that the exposed mice, when they were given the predator scent, they were more likely to freeze in terror compared to the controls. And this persisted all the way into adulthood. And the fMRI and the immunochemistry studies consistently showed an overactivation in fear-related regions of the brain. And here is the chilling part. When researchers looked at something very similar as part of the NIH-funded Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development Multicenter Study, they found the exact same thing. When they did the same test in people who were exposed to SSRIs as children, to scary faces, again, trying to elicit a fear response that they could measure in the brain, they saw the same exaggerated fear responses in the amygdala that they saw in mice. The scientists also noted that the SSRI-exposed kids had more anxiety and depressive symptoms, which were assessed by a parental questionnaire. And this seemed to have a stronger effect in girls who did appear to be more vulnerable to the effects of SSRIs. Now, these researchers looked at the data in all different ways to see if there was any other explanation. And the differences remained even after adjusting for different confounding factors like the mom's mental health. And so it really wasn't the depression. It was the drug exposure that was causing these behavioral changes measured in the brains. And so the key takeaway here is that the animal studies and the human studies are very consistent. And they're not just finding, you know, some functional changes in the way a brain lights up uh, underneath a scanner. They're actually seeing emotional processing changes as to how animals and humans now interpret uh, sensory stimulus differently. And there's an association that kids who were exposed when they were younger are actually having more problems with depression and, and anxiety. So let's move on now and talk about ADHD and autism. Given the structural and functional brain changes that we've talked about so far, could it be possible that antidepressant exposure 
could contribute to ADHD and autism? Well, there is some data that's looked into this, and these come from several large-scale epidemiological studies. And uh, they use things like insurance records and school databases and prescription histories. And at face value, the answer seems to be yes. Well, at least sort of, and I'm gonna explain that. So back in 2014, Dr. El Maroon analyzed the data of nearly 6,000 children and compared autistic traits in those exposed to SSRIs in the womb to uh, groups of kids whose moms had depression, which was untreated, and then also to another group whose moms did not have depression and were not treated with antidepressants. And what he found was that children exposed to SSRIs had more autistic traits compared to both other groups, essentially showing that it was not simply due to the mother's underlying mental illness. And he also found that children exposed to SSRIs in utero had higher rates of ADHD. Now, the next study that looked into this was a study done by Dr. Kenneth Mann, and he analyzed health records of over 190,000 children born in Hong Kong. And he found that the children whose mothers took antidepressants during pregnancy were more than twice as likely to be diagnosed with ADHD compared to those mothers that didn't. But what I need to say is that we have to be very cautious when we look at these results, because when statisticians went into that data afterwards and started making adjustments for different factors that might have influenced things such as you know factors within the family uh, education the way the kids were raised uh, the mental illness the association has actually disappeared in some of these studies and that's why when you look at several of these papers they will conclude that this link is explained away by these other variables and that there's not enough reliable evidence to be confident about the link. And this is exactly what Morales concluded when she did a large review of this data in 2018. Now, you might be hearing this and thinking, well, this is a good thing. This is evidence showing that this link, you know, may not be a real link and it's, it's something that we shouldn't be that worried about. But what I want to say is that these database studies in general have a lot of limitations, and I would be very hesitant to grab onto these findings and simply conclude that, you know, nothing to see here, there's no problems. Because some of the issues with these database studies are really obvious and, and they're serious limitations. For instance, whether or not the mom is taking antidepressants is just based on what was recorded in that insurance database. You know, it's like prescriptions. And most moms, they may get a prescription. And like many of the people I talk to, they go home and they don't take them or they take them for a few days and decide it's not for them. But it is now recorded in that database that they are taking antidepressants when they're not. And that is gonna dilute the signal down. If you have a whole bunch of people who are supposedly taking antidepressants, you know, based on the prescription data recorded in the uh, insurance database, but the moms actually aren't, it's gonna dilute that signal down. On top of that, the diagnoses like ADHD and autism are based on billing codes uh, rather than in-depth assessments. And what I can tell you about a psychiatrist who has worked in these systems, sometimes people just use those billing codes to justify giving out um, medications. And so these aren't great assessments. And so these big epidemiological studies, they make a lot of statistical noise. And I don't really think they're reliable enough, you know, their findings right now to conclude that there is no link between antidepressants and behavioral problems like ADHD and autism. And the reason that I'm going into a lot of detail here about these database studies is because they are the number one reason why many doctors believe that these drugs are completely safe in pregnancy. Um, I don't want to sound too cynical here, but if you follow my channel, you know, I'm very critical of the pharmaceutical industry. And essentially when the pharmaceutical industry finds a study or a group of studies that cast doubt on an association, they give it a platform. You know, they, they will support the researchers who are doing that research. They will send them to conferences. They will, you know, hand out their manuscripts to different doctors in the community. They will promote a certain side of the story that helps, uh, that helps their drug, that, that kind of waves away concerns and helps deal and, you know, and helps lead to more sales. And this is why most doctors are telling their patients right now that there's no, that there's no risk between these two things because they're essentially just focusing on these database studies where the authors have said, well, these studies, they really can't show anything. They can't show this link. All the while ignoring all of the other evidence that we have about MRI brain changes and functional and behavioral changes from um, other from those other 
evidence sources that I've just talked to you about. And this obviously is clearly very misleading and has this commercial bias behind it. And so putting aside, you know, the labels ADHD and autism, and let's just talk about like long-term brain changes that are going to lead to some behavioral differences um, in kids who are exposed to antidepressants long-term. Do I think this is likely? I do. I think it would be a miracle if this wasn't happening. I mean, after all, we've seen physical changes in the brain and we've also seen these behavioral changes, you know, when they're exposed to, you know, scary faces and things like that. And I mean, if you're having physical changes in the brain, it just makes sense to me that you will grow up and have some sort of behavioral changes. And so that's it for today. If you feel like you learned something important that your doctor never shared with you, please consider giving this video a like and sharing it with someone else who you think may find it useful. If you like what I do here on the channel, please subscribe as well. And if you are thinking about coming off your medications, what I wanna tell you is do not stop them suddenly. You have to taper slowly for it to be successful. And the next video is gonna show you exactly how to do that.